Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the International Bipolar Foundation today. I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Kim Young. Today, she'll be discussing the development of a real-time neurofeedback intervention for patients with major depressive disorder. While this research is specific to patients with unipolar depression, this model can be used as a framework on how to discover and develop other neurofeedback-based intervention in patients with bipolar disorder. Dr. Young earned a BA in psychology and sociology at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. She then went on to complete her MA and PhD in the Behavior, Con Cognition, and Neuroscience program at American University in Washington, DC in 2010. She has received numerous awards and has published 14 first author papers. Today, she, or excuse me, she will be continuing her research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine as an assistant professor of psychiatry starting in April. Welcome, Dr. Young. We're very happy to have you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. A big thank you to the International Bipolar Foundation and thank you to everyone today who's is listening. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about how I went from basic neuroscience research into developing a treatment for major depressive disorder. And um, I have no disclosures to, to announce. And this is basically what I'm going to cover. Um, I, I went from this approach really targets a specific problem that we know underlies the illness. And it's a treatment that's informed by basic neuroscience using what we've learned from brain imaging research and translating it into an intervention. Now, what I'm going to discuss today is really the model for how I accomplish this um, in patients with major depressive disorder. And I will discuss the potential for this therapy for bipolar depression at the end of my talk. And so what I'm going to discuss today is primarily autobiographical memory recall and how, why it's important, how it's impaired in depression, and how we can use it along with fMRI neurofeedback as a treatment for depression. So depression, um, just kind of a brief overview for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with unipolar depression, it is the leading cause of disability in the United States, according to the World Health Organization, with a lifetime prevalence of about 16.5%. The symptoms that I'm particularly interested in are those of loss of interest or pleasure and the attenuation of positive emotion. And the specific cognitive deficit that I began my research career in, uh, in examining is autobiographical memory. So autobiographical memory is memory for personally experienced events, things that have happened to you in your life. And the way that it's researched in the lab is using the autobiographical memory test, which was developed by Williams in 1986. And this is just a, a paper and pencil test where you present participants with positive, negative, and neutral keywords and ask them to recall a memory from their life that the keyword reminds them of. Now these memories can have different levels of specificity. And so the, a memory, it can be specific when it occurred at an identifiable time and place and did not last longer than 24 hours. So if, for example, I were to give a keyword like fail, an example of a specific memory would be, I failed an exam last Tuesday. That's what we generally think of when we think of autobiographical memory. Now, memories can also be categorical. And these are summaries or categories of events without referencing one specific episode. So for that fail keyword, a categorical memory would be, I failed a lot of exams in college. The, the person is referencing all the exams they failed, but they weren't able to get to one particular instance when they failed an exam. Memories can also be extended. These are memories for events that lasted longer than one day. So again, for our fail keyword, an example of an extended memory might be the week I spent studying for finals. There's no reference to one particular episode in there. It encompasses a, an entire week's worth of events. And memories can also just be facts without any events associated with them. So an example of a semantic memory for that fail keyword would be something like, I'm a failure. And it's well replicated and a consistent finding that patients with affective disorders, particularly major depressive disorder, have difficulty recalling specific autobiographical memories. And instead, they recall more categorical memories. 
So why is this important? Why does it matter that they can't recall autobiospecific memories? Uh, is this something that, that really we care about at all? Well, research has shown that autobiographical memory is critical for adaptive functioning in daily life. It serves a lot of functions in the ways we interact with each other and how we deal with the environment. For example, uh, one function of autobiographical memory is problem solving. You can use your past experiences to solve current problems, generate adaptive responses, predict future events, and understand the past. We know that patients with depressions have impaired problem solving abilities, and this has been found to correlate with the amount of overgenerality in their autobiographical memory recall. So the more able they are to recall specific memories, the less problem solving ability, the impairment that they have. Autobiographical memory is also a core strategy, a core coping strategy for events in our daily lives. It's an emotional regulation strategy. Uh, it also helps us to maintain optimism and euthymia in the face of stress and, monot uh, stress and monotony. And patients with depression have problems in both of these domains. And the degree of um, hopelessness and also emotional avoidance, affective reaction, so impairment in emotional regulation is also correlated with more overgeneral autobiographical memory recall. Finally, autobiographical memory has a social function. It helps us to maintain and develop social bonds. So it provides material for conversation, and it also allows us to experience empathy. And we know that patients with depression have a lot of problems in social interactions and daily social functioning. So autobiographical memory is impaired to depression, but it's also really important for how we function in our life. And so it might be also really important to uh, the experience of depression. Now, the current treatments, uh, so when I first started doing this, um, the first thing we wanted to look at was just how to define this in more detail. To, we know that depressed patients have fewer specific memories, but we wanted to characterize this more fully. So the first thing that uh, we looked at was whether or not this was a state marker that was just associated with someone who was experiencing depression, perhaps related to the symptom, symptoms of depression, or if it was a trait marker, if it was something that preceded the illness, that might be a marker for oncoming illness or related to the onset of, an, of the illness. And so what we did was we had healthy individuals who were medically and psychiatrically healthy, and they were adults. Then we had a group of high-risk individuals, and these were psychiatrically and medically healthy adults who had a first-degree family relative with depression. Uh, as we know that having a first-degree relative with the disorder makes you much more likely to develop it yourself. Then we also had a remitted depressed group, and these were unmedicated adults who had a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, but who had not been taking medication and had not had any severely impairing symptoms for over three months. And finally, we had an unmedicated adult major depressive disorder group. These were adults who were unmedicated and had been diagnosed with major depressive disorder and were currently experiencing a depressive episode. And what you see here is that our results suggest that this is a trait marker of depression. You can see that all of the groups had fewer specific and more categorical memories relative to the healthy individuals. This suggests that overgeneral autobiographical memory recall is a trait marker of depression. It's something that endures once the illness is over, and it's something that might be related to the onset and relapse of depression. Our next question was to look at the valence of these recalled memories. Was it overgeneral for all valences, or was it for a particular valence that we saw this? And so we took all the specific memories, and then we looked what percent of those specific memories were positive, negative, and neutral. And these were ratings provided by the participant. And what we see is that only in the remitted and the currently depressed group were there fewer positive specific memories. The healthy group and the high-risk group didn't differ from each other in any measures, and none of the groups differed on the percent of negative or neutral memories. So while overgenerality in autobiographical memory is a trait marker of depression, overgenerality for positive autobiographical memories appears to be an epiphenomenon. It appears to be related to experiencing a depressive episode, and this is because we can 
uh, assume this because the high-risk individuals don't have that deficit in positive memories. And finally, we wanted to know if any of these deficits were related to mood. And this came about because anecdotally, uh, subjects were telling me that they love doing the task. They, they come out of the scanner and they said, oh, that was great. You know, my, my spouse tells me I have no memories. I feel like I have no memories. Just sitting in there being forced to recall memories was a great experience. And so we wanted to see if there were any measures that we were giving people that could capture what they were telling me. And we found there was difference um, before and after the scan in one particular measure. And this is the state trait anxiety inventory. So this measures how anxious people are currently, which is the state part, and then how they generally function, how anxious they generally are. And this is the trait part. And what you see is that the state anxiety level doesn't change pre to post scan. Individuals are just as anxious coming out of the scanner as they were going into the scanner. But where you do see the change is in this trait, this stable measure of trait anxiety. It has a very high test retest reliability. And what you see is that in both the currently depressed and the remitted depressed groups, there's a significant decrease in this trait measure of anxiety. It appears that they're reevaluating their life in a less negative manner after doing this task. And when we look to see what this might be correlated, or if this is correlated with any of their performance or any of their brain activity, what we found was that there was a strong correlation between this change and the percent of positive specific memories they recalled. So the more positive specific memories are depressed and are remitted depressed patients recalled, the greater the decrease in this trait measure of anxiety. So it seems that recalling positive specific autobiographical memories may have some therapeutic effect. Well, current treatments that we have today don't address autobiographical memory recall. The top three treatments that are used have not changed autobiographical memory specificity. So for example, in one study that looked at this with antidepressant efficacy, you can see here this graph shows um, higher means more over general. So in the other graphs I was showing you higher meant more specific, so higher is bad here. And what you see is that after a 28-day treatment with an SSRI, patients were remitted, their HAMD scores, their Hamilton Depression Rating scores were back in the mild, not depressed range. But there was no change in their autobiographical memory recall. They recalled the same percent of positive specific and negative specific memories as they did before receiving the treatment and going into remission. And they, that it was significantly different from the control group. We have cognitive behavioral therapy. This tries to target maladaptive thinking and affects emotions and behavior. And there is some evidence that, in that autobiographical memory specificity can change with cognitive behavioral therapy. As you can see in this graph, uh, there was a slight increase. The changes are very small and not significant. Um, also, CBT, while very effective, is also time consuming and requires well-trained therapists. Finally, we have electroconvulsive therapy. This is one of the most effective treatments out there for depression. But most people don't study whether or not it affects autobiographical memory because one of the side effects of this is amnesia. It's not whether or not people are recalling specific memories, it's whether or not they're recalling any memory. Uh, there has been one study that I found that did look at specificity after ECT and found that there was a reduction in the specificity of autobiographical memories, and I don't believe there was a feelings effect there. And the newer treatments that are out there, such as deep brain stimulation, haven't looked at this. And so this cognitive deficit and depression that seems so related to the illness is something that isn't changed with treatment, and it needs to be better addressed. So the next question I'm sure you have is, okay, well, why not just have people recall positive memories? That's it. The, that's the solution. That's how we'll treat them. Everyone will get better, recall positive memories. Well, somebody's done that, and it doesn't work. Uh, Jorman et al. did a study where they had healthy individuals, individuals remitted from depression, and currently depressed individuals watch a sad film. Then he had them recall positive autobiographical memories in order to repair their mood. And what you can see in this graph here is that in healthy controls it worked. They saw the sad movie, they recalled positive memories, and it improved their mood. They were less sad after the task. But in the remitted patients, it had no effect on mood. They were just as sad after recalling their memories. 
And in the actively depressed patients, it actually made their mood worse. They were more sad after recalling positive memories. So it's not just recalling positive memories in and of itself that can be helpful to depressed patients. It has to be recalling positive memories in conjunction with something else. And so what that something else is, we decided to investigate using fMRI. And I'll explain a little bit about what that is in a minute. We wanted to understand the brain regions that were underlying positive autobiographical memory recall and how they were different in patients with depression. Um, and this, this, we did this because understanding what's wrong, understanding what's underlying this difficulty in positive autobiographical memory recall is the path to discovering how to change it. It's how we translate things from the, the clinic to the, to the real world. So we used fMRI, this is functional magnetic resonance imaging, and this measures brain activity by detecting changes in blood flow. It, it detects changes in blood oxygenation. And so the, the theory is that neuro, neuronal activity is coupled with blood flow and oxygenation. And when an area of the brain is in use, blood flow and oxygen use to that region also increases. So when you see an increased bold response uh, in, in your task, that means that this area, that's interpreted to mean this area is more active, that it's being used more. And so we wanted to look at the neural systems underlying the behavioral effects of reduced positive specific autobiographical memories. So we compared specific memory recall of positive memories to example generation, and I'll go into that task detail in a minute. Uh, and here are a couple of the publications in the various groups that we've, we've uh, looked at right here. So the way we did this in the scanner was we, had, we adapted the autobiographical memory test. We gave subjects a keyword. We asked them to think of a memory from their life that the keyword reminds them of and then asked them to rate that memory on the level of specificity, which they were trained on those definitions and were able to provide examples of before they got into the scanner, and also the valence of that memory. Now, when you do fMRI, you can't just look at brain activity. It doesn't really tell you anything. It's compared to something. So we had two comparison conditions. The first was a semantic control task. And this is to control for general knowledge and memory retrieval. So in this task, participants were asked to think of examples from a given category, and we had positive, negative, and neutral categories, then rate the ease with which they came up with the examples and the number they came up with. And so then when you go into the statistical analysis, when you subtract the brain activity during autobiographical memory recall from the brain activity during this example generation and this, this control task, what you're left with are the brain regions that are necessary for generating this specific memory beyond just general cognitive processes, general memory, general processing. When you add this kind of control task, you're really looking at what it takes to get to a specific memory be above and beyond just general search processes. We also had a low-level visual baseline task. This is a riser detection task, and basically the riser is a letter with a part that rises above the tops of the other letters. So in this example here, the T and the L would be risers. That's an even number, and subjects just had to indicate whether that number was even or odd. And this is what the task looked like. It went memory or category keyword, riser task, riser rating, then the ratings on the keyword, and then the riser task again. And people were in the scanner uh, for about 70 to 80 minutes. And after the scan, we did do a post-scan interview where subjects discussed the memories they were recalling during the scan, and uh, the experimenter who was pulling to diagnosis would corroborate their specificity ratings. So one region that we kept seeing pop up in our results but didn't quite reach significance uh, was the amygdala. And so I'm going to focus on this region. We did what's called a small volume correction to increase our power to really detect differences. And we increased our sample size. And um, we really wanted to look at this region's function during autobiographical memory. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard about how the amygdala is involved in fight or flight, in negative responses, in fear, but it does more than that. It is a salience detector. 
So it detects and responds to any environmental stimulus that is salient, that's worth noticing. This is true for aversive stimuli, but it's also true for repetitive or positive stimuli. Furthermore, the amygdala is one of the core set of regions that's recruited during autobiographical memory recall in healthy individuals. And it's more active in healthy individuals when they recall positive autobiographical memories than when they recall negative autobiographical memories. So that's one region right here. Uh, seems like it might be really important for positive specific autobiographical memory recall. We also know this region is very important in depression. Again, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the amygdala's hyperactivity to negative stimuli. The amygdala is overreactive to negative stimuli in depressed individuals relative to healthy individuals. But there's another side of the coin. It's doubly dissociated from healthy individuals. And by that I mean not only is it the response exaggerated to negative stimuli, but it's reduced or attenuated to positive stimuli relative to healthy individuals. So these results over here, which are done by Dr. Victor, who I work with here at Laureate, uh, she showed sad faces and happy faces. And the main point I want you to take away here is that you see that the depressed individuals had the enhanced amygdala response relative to the healthy individuals to those sad faces. But the healthy individuals had a normative response, amygdala response to those happy faces that depressed patients just didn't have. And this has been found for words, faces, and pictures. Furthermore, the responsiveness to positive stimuli is correlated inversely with depression severity. So the more active your amygdala is when you see positive faces, the less depressed you are. And so we really wanted to focus on whether the amygdala would show a similar pattern for positive autobiographical memory recall. And so we took our, our large sample and did what's called a small volume correction and looked specifically at the amygdala. And what we found was that there is the enhanced response to negative memories. The depressed individuals relative to the healthy individuals do have enhanced amygdala reactivity. But the depressed individuals relative to all of the other groups, the healthy individuals, the high-risk individuals, the remitted individuals, had a blunted amygdala response when they were recalling positive autobiographical memories. You see the same pattern in the left and right amygdala, but the results are stronger in the left amygdala. And this makes sense, because the left amygdala is thought to be involved in detailed and elaborate stimulus evaluation, where the right amygdala is more involved in the rapid automatic detection of emotional stimuli. And so that's why we've decided to focus on the left amygdala. Uh, we also found that this was, uh, like other studies, the amygdala responsiveness was inversely correlated with depression severity. So the more active the amygdala was when positive memories were recalled, the lower the depression score. And we didn't see this relationship for negative specific memories or for specific memories when they were combined across valences. So you still might be wondering, well, if there, there's all this research that shows the amygdala is overactive. Why am I trying to upregulate the amygdala? Why not downregulate it? Well, there are groups that have tried this. And first, it's been found that it's really hard to downregulate an emotion-related region. It's much easier to upregulate these emotion regions. Nevertheless, one study has attempted this in healthy individuals, where they had people view aversive pictures and told them to lower the bar on the screen. And what you see here is that they were able to lower their amygdala response a little, but the control group, which was actually getting feedback from the brainstem, downregulated their amygdala more than the experimental group. So downregulating is probably not where focus is, is best directed. It probably is not going to pan out as a, a really effective intervention. But there are other individuals testing that, and, and we'll, we'll see, research will show, and they're, they're doing those studies right now. So we decided to target this amygdala hyporeactivity with neurofeedback. Neurofeedback is basically information about the brain is fed back to the user, and after enough time and training, this change can be done, uh, it can be self-sufficient and sustained without the, without the actual neurofeedback and result in long-lasting behavioral changes. 
The spatial specificity of fMRI lets us look at specific brain regions. So it lets us get to the amygdala, which is a really deep structure. It's located really deep in the brain. It, basically, if you put a, drew a line through your eye and your ear, where those lines intersected is where your amygdala is. And so fMRI is one of the few technologies that really can image this in, a, in any degree of, of accuracy. There has been a lot of studies on neurofeedback in healthy individuals, and it's been shown they can learn to regulate activity in a variety of regions, including regions important for emotion, including ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, interior cingulate cortex, and, in, and the insula. And studies are just now starting to be done in patient populations, and it's been shown that it has clinical utility in reducing symptoms of pain, tinnitus, Parkinson's disease, and I've just seen some data coming out showing it also might be effective for helping people quit smoking and spider phobias. So our goal was to restore the positive processing bias in the amygdala. We wanted to train patients with depression to access their amygdala and modulate their amygdala while they were generating positive autobiographical memories and see if that had the potential to improve mood, to improve the emotional state in depression. And so this is, you know, this is the setup, this is our scanner, you go in the scanner. We also have been doing uh, concurrent EEG electroencephalography measurements and I'll talk a little bit about that near the end. So this is basically what the task looks like. Um, for each of these runs, there are alternating 40-second blocks of resting, where you just fixate on the screen, try not to think of anything in particular, happy, which is where you think of your happy memories, and counting, where you count backwards from a number provided. Now, at the beginning, we have a baseline run. At the end, we have a transfer run. These runs are identical to all of the training runs, except for the fact that you don't receive neurofeedback. You don't see any bars. The reason we have this is so that at the baseline, we can see what an individual subject amygdala is doing, if this is a treatment they need, uh, and confirm that their amygdala is indeed hypoactive to positive memory recall. The transfer run allows us to determine whether learning has occurred, whether they can use what they've learned during the training and maintain that amygdala response in the absence of neurofeedback now. And it provides a really nice metric of success because you can compare the amygdala activity during the transfer run to the amygdala activity in baseline. And you can get a really nice measure of how effective that training was at increasing their amygdala response to positive memory recall. And this is essentially what they saw when they were doing the neurofeedback task. They were told to recall positive autobiographical memories that are specific, vivid, and highly arousing in order to activate their amygdala. Now, depressed patients have trouble recalling specific memories, so they went through a pre-scan interview with me or my research assistant in which they came up with a baseline of positive memories to use. Because uh, the first thing you say to a depressed participant, I need, I need you to think of some positive memories, they tell you, you don't have any. So we always made sure they had some memories to use as a baseline. And some of the most common memories that seemed to be effective for patients were time with a family member or a pet birth of a child, and a fun vacation or a special date. Now, uh, this seems to be more for women. We've finally started uh, getting some more men into our protocol, and it seems that the women, th these are the memories that work, but for the men, it's arousal-related memories that work. So it's skydiving, a great game of laser tag, or a sexual encounter. It seem to be those kind of memories that are effective for men. And when they're receiving neurofeedback, they see this red bar, and the red bar goes up or down, and it shows the percent signal change of their amygdala relative to the preceding 40-second rest block. And it's updated every two seconds. So it's not immediate neurofeedback. It does have about a two-second delay before they see the, the effects. And they're instructed about that delay before they go into the scanner. And the blue bar is the target level. This is how high we want them to get their amygdala up to. And we increase it a little bit as the experiment progresses so that we're trying to uh, teach them to go a little bit higher every time. And then, again, this is what the baseline and the transfer run looked like. There were no bars. They were just told to think of their memories and feel as happy as possible while they were doing it. The count condition was used as a palate cleanser, basically. We wanted to have people stop thinking about their memories and allow that amygdala signal to return to baseline. And then the rest condition was what we used to determine the baseline for the neurofeedback task. We had two groups. 
So we had our experimental group that got left amygdala neurofeedback, but we also had an active control. And this group received feedback from the left horizontal segment of the interparietal sulcus. We'll call it hips from here. I'm just going to refer to it to control neurofeedback from now on. And basically, this allows us to see whether controlling the amygdala while we're calling positive memories is, is really what's driving treatment effects, or if you could control any brain region. The hips is putatively not involved in emotion regulation or emotional processing, so patients get to recall positive memories, they get that feedback, but we don't think it should be changing their mood because it's not really a network or a region or part of a network that's dysfunctional in depression or really involved in autobiographical memory recall at all. Patients were told they could be assigned to either group, but that they wouldn't know what group they were assigned to. They were also told that they could change the memories they were thinking of and the properties of the memories they were thinking of, but they should not change from the strategy of positive memory recall. And this was to prevent them from learning something harmful. We know the amygdala can be activated during negative experiences, during fear, anxiety, and so we didn't want patients coming, finding a strategy that put the amygdala way up very easily, but that wasn't helpful for them. So they were told to stick to positive memories. They could change the positive, what memories they were using, but stick to positive memories. And this is registered as a clinical trial. It's randomized, double-blind, um, and it encompassed four visits. Their first visit was the baseline visit where we get some clinical ratings. They also did the paper and pencil, pencil autobiographical memory task. And then they did an emotional processing task called the backward masking task, which I'll get into a little bit later. Then they had two neurofeedback sessions, and these were one week apart. Following that second neurofeedback session, one week afterwards, they came back and they did visit one again. Essentially, they did the clinical ratings, the autobiographical memory test, and the backward masking task. So these are the uh, outcomes from the clinical trial so far. While we're not enrolling any more subjects, we do have a couple subjects that are currently enrolled and finishing up the protocol. So this is the data we've collected thus far. And what you can see is that in the experimental group that actually learned to control their amygdala, both clinician-administered and self-report ratings of depression severity dramatically decreased. There was a 50% decrease, uh, plus or minus, in all of these depression severity rating scores. And it went from the moderately to severely depressed range down to the mild depressed range on all of these measures. In the control group, you see a nominal decrease in scores. It's about 10% on all of these measures. And um, in no case is it actually a significantly different drop from the baseline. So we are seeing a modest placebo effect in the control group, but the experimental group is getting much better. And in fact, in the experimental group, six subjects have met criteria for remission at the study's end. That's about a third of our group. So these results are really encouraging because they're very similar to what we see with antidepressants. About a third of patients respond to their first antidepressant, and there's about a 50% reduction overall in depressive symptoms. Um, so this really does suggest that there's a, there's a lot of clinical potential for this intervention. Now, you can see here that there is a relationship between the score change and actually receiving the neurofeedback. The control group today is pretty steady, goes down a little bit over the course. Um, but the experimental group, you don't start seeing improvements in their depression scores until after they start receiving the neurofeedback. It goes down even more after the second neurofeedback session. Currently, we're only following them up for one week afterwards, um, and longer-term follow-up is necessary, and it is in our plans, our future directions, is to follow them up and see how long the effects last. Uh, I don't know, are we completely curing them? Are we giving them the tools where they can, can use, the, where they can cure themselves? Is it something that's lasting two weeks, six weeks? Can we give them booster sessions? That's all kind of still open for, for, the, for interpretation. We're, we're going to be looking up at that later. This is the uh, results that shows their amygdala activity. So blue is the experimental group, red is the control group. And what you see is that at baseline, neither group can activate their amygdala during positive specific memory recall. Just like our, our previous study, they have a blunted amygdala reactant. Now with training, the experimental group increases their amygdala activity. This is the average amygdala response over the training runs on the first day. And they're able to maintain this during the transfer run in which no neurofeedback information is provided. 
and this, you can see the good child group, their amygdala is not changing. Then participants go away for a week and they come back. And what you see, and they do the same thing, this is this baseline run right here. And what you can see is that our experimental group, they're not where they were when they left, but they're higher than they were when they started. So this does suggest that more than one session is necessary, that maybe three or four sessions might even be beneficial. Right now we've only been ex uh, examining two. You also see again, they're able to upregulate their amygdala and maintain it during the transfer run. And what you also see now is that the variance is reduced. So people are able to keep their amygdala activated more consistently as well. This is single subject data, just to show you that it's not being driven by one outlier who was super regulating their, their amygdala. You can see that in the experimental group, pretty much every subject increases their amygdala response to some degree from that pre-training baseline to the final transfer run. Um, where you can see in the control group, there's not really a pattern. Sometimes the amygdala goes down, sometimes the amygdala goes up, sometimes the amygdala doesn't change. Uh, I also want to point out that in a couple subjects, like subject here, here, and here, their amygdala is already responsive to positive memories at baseline. So they might actually be people that, that aren't suitable for this intervention. This may be an individually tailored intervention. We also, I told you, did the autobiographical memory test, and we found that in the experimental group, the percent of specific memories and positive specific memories increased following treatment. Uh, the control group did not change in any of these measures, and you can see that the percent of negative memories didn't change significantly in the active group, that the change in specific memories overall was really driven by the increase in positive autobiographical memory recall in the experimental group. So that's really exciting for me because this is a cognitive deficit that hasn't been changed with traditional treatments. It's something that hasn't been addressed, and we're able to not only make people feel better, but improve their positive autobiographical memory recall. And there's a correlation between all of these variables. So the more able you are to regulate your amygdala, the greater amygdala regulation success you have, the greater your decrease in your depression score. Furthermore, the more positive memories you're able to recall after the intervention, the greater your decrease in depression score. And finally, the more able you are to recall positive memories, the greater your amygdala response to those positive memories. So the way we think this is working here and um, requires further mediation analysis, we think that we're having patients bring their amygdala online and that enables them to then recall more positive memories in their life, which then allows them to reap the benefit that, right, that healthy individuals have from recalling these memories and makes them better, improves their, their depression, makes them closer to a healthy individual. Now, the amygdala is just one region, and the brain doesn't work in isolation. It works in connection with a lot of other regions. And so we were interested to see what other regions were changing with the amygdala. And we do this with a functional connectivity analysis. So we see what regions are more correlated with the amygdala, so do they activate with the amygdala more after the training than before the training, and is this difference uh, greater than what you see in the control group? And what we found was that the amygdala increased its connectivity, its relationship, with a lot of regions that are involved in salience and self-referential processing. These are medial prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, precuneus, and also regions involved in reward and enjoyment. So we have a lot of striatal reward regions and also a ventrolateral prefrontal cortex region that's been specifically associated with enjoyment. Uh, we do see some decreased connectivity with some temporal and parietal regions. I'm not entirely sure how to interpret that. Uh, one potential interpretation is that these regions are involved in language. Maybe patients are relying less on their verbal representations of the memory. Uh, these regions are also involved with social processing, so they could be relying less on thinking about others when they're recalling their memories and recalling them more for their self. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that means, but that it does mean that it's something we're investigating. And so um, what I think, the way I think this intervention is working is that by tapping into the amygdala, we're tapping into the rest of the salience and reward network. We're making these positive memories something that patients want to notice 
want to focus on, want to incorporate into their sense of selves, and that's what's making them better. And we looked at these regions to see if there was any one particular connectivity change that was associated with improvement, and we found that it was this ventrolateral prefrontal area. So the greater the connectivity between the amygdala and this region after neurofeedback, the greater the decrease in depression scores. So one question that people often ask me is, okay, how do you know you're not just non-specifically increasing the amygdala? How do you know you're not just increasing the amygdala to everything? That they're not just you know, getting more amygdala activity to sad things, to positive things, we're not just making the amygdala more reactive. And so to test this, we included a backward masking task. And basically, this measures the amygdala's response to implicitly presented faces. So at the start of the scan, they're told, uh, they're shown two what we call neutral target faces, and they're told that they want to look out for these faces. Then during the scan, they're shown faces in a rapid succession, and they're asked to indicate if the face they see matches one of those target faces. Now the tar these faces here that they're presented can be happy, sad, or neutral in their facial expression, and they're saying whether or not the match is identity. It doesn't matter if the valence of the face is different. Now two faces are shown. There is one face called the masked face that is only shown for about 26 milliseconds. Subjects do not consciously perceive this face. Then there's the masking face, which is presented for 107 milliseconds, and this is the face that patients, are, that the participants are making that rating of match or not on. That's the one that they consciously see, and we do checks to make sure that they're not seeing the implicit faces. Nevertheless, this task has shown that the amygdala responds to the implicit, the valence of the implicit face. And so this was one way for us to test whether or not we were not specifically increasing the amygdala. So we looked at the amygdala response, and we did it for two contrasts. We did it when the sad face was in this masking, this masked position, and the neutral face was in the masking position, and when the happy face was in the masked position, and the neutral face was in the masking position. And what we see is, is great. It's showing that we are teaching people to regulate their amygdala, not just increase their amygdala. So over here, you see that in the experimental group, the amygdala is increasing its response to that positive, to those positive implicitly presented faces, where there's no change in the control group. But in the experimental group, we're also decreasing the, the amygdala response to negative faces, while there's no change in the control group. And this is also is the same pattern you see when you give depressed individuals antidepressant treatment. So you see that the amygdala response to sad faces decreases after antidepressant treatment, and the amygdala response to positive faces increases after antidepressant treatment. So we're really normalizing this emotional bias in the amygdala. We're not just increasing it to everything. So uh, I hope what I've, I've conveyed to you today is that autobiographical memory recall is important in our lives. It's a trait marker of depression that's not addressed by current treatments. The amygdala is under-responsive to positive stimuli in depression, including positive autobiographical memories. And we can train patients with depression to increase that amygdala response to positive memories by using real-time fMRI neurofeedback. We believe that this is effective um, because by regulating the amygdala, we're tapping into a broader network of other regions, and it suggests that these positive memories are becoming more salient, personally relevant, and enjoyable to participants. They're becoming something they can use in their daily lives. And learning to regulate the amygdala to positive memories improves symptoms, it improves autobiographical memory recall, and it shifts the emotional processing bias towards the positive in depression. So what's the clinical potential of this? Well, one advantage is that it's non-invasive. There are no drugs, no needles, no implants, and it's really informed by what we know of neuroscience, of the mechanisms underlying the onset and recovery from depression. For so long, we've depression treatments have really just been happy accidents or shots in the dark, and we didn't have this targeted approach. We're also enhancing feelings of self-efficacy and uh, using some principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, the disadvantage is the cost and the environment. Not every clinician has access to an fMRI scanner and a researcher who can run this protocol. 
and fMRI scanning is expensive. One neurofeedback session here would cost about $1,000. So um, this doesn't mean that it won't be available as a treatment. I could very easily envision insurance companies paying for this before it, we went before a patient went into a more invasive treatment like deep brain stimulation or ECT. Uh, however, I do realize that it's probably not the most practical, and so we're looking, one of our future goals is to move it outside the scanner. So I showed you that picture of that girl wearing that electroencephalography cap, the EEG cap. And what we're doing, that is a really inexpensive and portable device. You can use it at home. And so we're trying to, but the problem with it is that it can't really get at deep structures in the brain. It really can only measure the, the surface structures. Uh, prefrontal structures. And so if we can find some correlates of let, what changes in that EEG are correlated with the amygdala changes, then we could develop an out-of-the-scanner out intervention that could be used by anyone. So that is one uh, future direction that we're taking this in. Also, I showed you those prefrontal regions that are changing with the amygdala during the treatment. Those regions could theoretically be targeted with transcranial magnetic stimulation. So we are we're working to develop this task further to see how many sessions are needed, how long the effects are, but we're also looking outside and beyond the scanner to see how we can bring this into a more widely available treatment that everybody can use, not just people who have access to an fMRI, aren't claustrophobic, and don't have any metal implants. So what about bipolar disorder? I just want to close here with a couple of slides on what I've been doing with bipolar disorder. Um, and this, I really think that the model used for depression can be used for other disorders. And so I started my research to look at autobiographical memory recall in bipolar depression. So this is a relatively small sample of about 16 unmedicated bipolar uh, disordered individuals. And they were currently in a depressive episode. So that's another um, thing that's going to be difficult when targeting bipolar individuals because do you target them in the depressed phase, in the manic phase, in the euthymic phase? Are the brain regions different during these phases? Um, so there's a lot more work still to do with bipolar depression. But I can show, I can show you that they have, patients with bipolar depression have the same autobiographical memory deficits as patients with unipolar depression. So they have fewer specific and more categorical memories. However, their amygdala response is normal, if not hyperactive, when compared to healthy controls. So when they recall positive memories, you see the blunted activation here in the depressed individuals in the amygdala. And the bipolar individuals have a, a response that's a little bit higher even than the healthy individuals. So this suggests that amygdala neurofeedback uh, is not going to be the route to take for, for bipolar disorder. And this was confirmed in our pilot study when we had two individuals who were misdiagnosed. Uh, they were diagnosed by our psychiatrists having unipolar depression. It turns out they were actually bipolar individuals. They have bipolar disorder. And both of them went into a manic episode as soon as they completed the first neurofeedback task. So this suggests that the, the amygdala neurofeedback is functioning very much like an antidepressant and that a bipolar individual might not ben would not benefit from this um, and that they would have to be on lithium or some sort of mood stabilizer before we would even investigate this particular neurofeedback. But there are other brain regions that we can target. Uh, and again, these preliminary results suggest two regions that might be good to target for neurofeedback. The first is the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And what you can see here is that bipolar individuals have decreased activity in this region when they're recalling positive specific memories. This region is involved in cognitive control and executive function. So it suggests that they are reducing their cognitive control mechanisms when they're recalling positive memories. And this is one region that's consistently reported to have decreased activity in bipolar disorder individuals. Another region here is this right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. And so uh, if you remember, that's the region that was increasing with amygdala activity in our depressed individuals after neurofeedback and was correlated with symptom improvement. Now, in bipolar, bipolar individuals, this region is overactive compared to both the healthy individuals and the depressed individuals as they recall positive autobiographical memories. 
as I said before, this is uh, found to be involved in the experience of enjoyment and emotional expression. So it seems like in bipolar disorder, the goal is going to be to maybe bring down the response to positive memories in these reward centers and increase the response of these control, these cognitive control regions such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So again, this is a really early stage of research. Um, this is you know, probably in the first two years of my six-year journey to develop this for uh, depression. But it does point, point to some avenues, which I will be exploring, to see if we can find a good region or a good network to feed back to bipolar individuals while they recall positive memories. So I just want to thank you all for listening. Thank you for your time. Uh, if you want to know more, you can contact me at this email address. But uh, as was mentioned, I will be moving to the University of Pittsburgh on April 1st. So if you have any questions, if you're listening to this later, you want to contact me, you're going to want to use this PIT email address. And I'd very much like to thank my mentors, especially Dr. Badurka and Dr. Drevitz, who have been so integral in, in helping develop me into the independent investigator that I've become today. And uh, I'm happy to take questions now. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing um, your current research and the incredible insight with us. Um, again, if you have any questions, um, just type those in the control panel, and I will certainly be happy to um, share those with Dr. Young. And I don't want, do want to remind everyone that this um, webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website uh, for future viewing or to share with others. Um, I'll give you another minute or so for questions. Well, Dr. Young, it looks like you've answered everyone's questions today. Um, it was a very thorough um, talk, and we certainly appreciate it. And again, thank you for sharing your contact information. Should anyone think of something um, after the fact and they're able to contact you, and you can certainly contact me at dbrown at ibpf org, and I'd be happy to forward those questions um, to Dr. Young. And we look forward to hearing more about your future research and how that affects bipolar disorder. So be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.